we are still talking uh, about burdens and carrying godly burdens. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 7 through 9. Chapter 6, beginning at verse 7, we'll read verse 7 through 9. <clears throat> Amen. Galatians chapter 6. Amen. And when you get there, say amen. 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 Beginning at verse 7, <clears throat> very familiar scripture. See what the word of the Lord has to say. Amen. And it says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall weep of the flesh corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. <laughs> And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You may have your seats. I'm going to read it again, but I'm going to read it in the Amplified Version. And the Amplified Version says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. He will not allow himself... <laughs> To be made a fool out of, nor treated with contempt, nor allow his precepts to be scornfully set aside. For whatever a man sows, this and this only is what he will reap. For the one who sows to his flesh, his sinful capacity, his worldliness, his disgraceful impulses, will reap from the flesh ruins and destruction. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And then it says, let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap if we do not give in. Amen. Amen. And today for a subtopic, if you allow me to speak from these words, I want to talk about carry love, not frustration. Repeated, carry love, not frustration. Anybody ever been frustrated before? Notice I didn't say upset. Has anybody ever been frustrated before? Has anybody ever irritated you before? And caused your frustration? Or fed your frustration? We all understand that word. And frustrating is simply means it's an instance of being frustrated. It's something that is an unresolved problem. Frustration is an unresolved problem. It's a feeling of dissatisfaction. It's often accompanied with anxiety or depression. Yeah. Did you catch that? It's often accompanied, accompanied with it. Some things go with it. Anxiety or depression. Because it's an unresolved problem, it's causing you havoc. It's causing you a level of irritation. Too often, believers and people in general, we carry more frustration than we do love. I'm going to break those two down because it's important for us to carry love more than frustrated. I'm not saying that you're not going to be frustrated, but what you carry, meaning you have the choice to either harbor or to disconnect yourself from. But we often carry frustration. Have you ever said in your mind, when I see them, I've already put together a series of words and phrases that I'm going to articulate 
I haven't seen them yet, but it's in my mind. When I see them two days from now, when I get back to work next week, I've already mustered how I'm going to articulate that. And what I want us to understand is many times because we carry frustration is what we're producing. It's what we're seeing. A lot of times we don't realize how much power that we really have as believers. Many times because we carry frustration, that's the first thing that we share or display. And love is something we should carry more than frustration. And I'm not talking about surface love because that's not good enough. Frustration is something that every human experiences. It's a natural experience. It's an emotion that you're going to get. But what happens is we make the choice whether or not we decide to stay in that state of frustration. Frustration has a way of either deterring you, messing with your thought pattern, it can mess with your emotions, and more importantly, when it's harbored, it can mess with your physical body. Yes. Frustrated people often have bad behavior. Because we respond based on what we are feeling. Uh -huh. It's going on in my mind. I see what's happening. But I want us to understand that the Bible is very clear. It tells us that God is not mocking. In other words, he's not a joke. Don't think whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. In other words, God has said, whatever you're willing to put time, effort, and energy in is what you're going to produce. Yes. If you're tired of a frustrating and annoying life, you have to understand that you can reproduce what you want. Some frustration doesn't always come from the lack of somebody else's not doing what you need. Many times we're already frustrated. I don't think we realize it. I found out that when you go from zero to a hundred, you are already frustrated. Because normally if something happened, you should go from zero to twenty. And then maybe forty. And then maybe sixty. But when you go from zero to a hundred, there is something that is already annoying and bothering you. And we have to understand that God is so wise and he's so smart that he has already created a, a way for us to reap, meaning whatever you sow, he said that you will get. In other words, you can't sow frustration and reap happiness. You can't sow contentment and reap peace. You can't be contentious and think that liberty is going to work. I'm going to have a peaceful home. No, you're not. You're contentious. The Bible speaks about contention. In other words, we don't realize that we can produce what we want. And if we don't like what we're producing, then we have to change what's in us. The first key is we have to understand that frustration will speak. Yes. It don't need you to speak for it. It'll talk. Yes. All frustration don't mean you have to articulate words. I know people all the time that are frustrated. You, They never say anything but their actions. Yes. You ever seen somebody so upset they can't say nothing? That's frustration. I don't want to talk right now. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I've been so frustrated, I can't talk. That's when you know you're too frustrated. You can't articulate what's in your mind. You say, well, mm. Give me about a minute. And I've noticed that minute has turned into hours. And them hours have turned into days. And them days have turned into weeks. And them weeks have turned into months. And the months have turned into years. And now it is no longer frustration. It is resentment. Resentment is like being passive aggressive. You ever see somebody? Instead of being direct, they making little snark remarks. You being passive aggressive. That's what resentment is. It don't want to really show you it's mad at you. But it's going to do a little something to agonize you. It's going to pick at you. Say the wrong thing. I told you about people like that. Never got nothing good to say. If there's a wrinkle in your outfit, they're going to find it. If there's a piece of lint on your shoe, they're going to find it. I'm afraid 
believe in them type of people. I believe in being detailed, but how do you find the worst? They look at everything you do. Most of us spend more time than we should on ourselves because we're trying to make sure that we look our best because we're afraid of what somebody else is going to say. You can't even worship God because you don't know what somebody's going to say. Did your socks match? You looking at your socks. Am I wearing blue? Are they both blue today? Because I have put on black and blue. Frustration will speak. Too many times with expression, we express frustration more than we express our heart. And this is one of the reasons why things are clouded. And we are constantly in a distasteful or distraining area of our relationship because we don't get to express what our real heart is because we're constantly in a state of frustration. It's what we reap. And I want you to understand that Galatians, Paul, Apostle Paul wrote Galatians. When we look at the top of it, he already starts with teaching us how we got ourselves messed up. He told us, don't even, first of all, I don't even want you to start judging. If you see your brother in the fall, it says, he who is spiritual, go to such a woman. People that are spiritually sensitive and non-judgmental know how to live without being frustrated. Many people are frustrated because they're disappointed. And until you release from disappointment, you will always be frustrated. It's why so many of us have kept ourselves away or we push people away because we're disappointed in ourselves the way things happen and it's caused us to be frustrated. And frustration will block love every time. We're supposed to be carriers of love. But frustration will block love. Every time. I don't think we understand it. It's something all of us has to get used to and we have to learn that if I want to be loved and receive, I cannot present my annoyance and I cannot present my frustration because nobody opens arms to frustration. It's not that easy. Frustration hurts when somebody gives it to you. You like this one. Must be frustrated. Yeah, don't touch me. Not today. Don't touch me. Wait a minute, not today. Don't touch me today. You, you, that, you that mad? You that frustrated? Yeah, don't touch me today. Okay. That's what some of us need. We need somebody to touch us. Even though you mad, let me touch you. Stop being mad. Get over here. You know, my grandmother had, my great grandmother had, a, she believed in whooping people and then hugging. Those two to me didn't go together. It kind of didn't make sense when we was coming up. Who whooped somebody and then hugged? I was like, no, we don't need to do this. We don't need to do this. I don't need a whooping and then you hug me. But I got what she was doing. She was trying to make sure that I understood correction. And then you don't need to grow hard. Because sometimes when you whoop somebody and correct them, you actually don't need them to go away by themselves. This is what we're talking about. We need to restore them. That's right. But frustration has a way of blocking our love, our heart. This is another reason why we have to communicate issues with one another. Because we don't share our heart enough. Whenever you share the thing that is exactly bothering you or what people are doing or what situations are hurting, we are able to then receive what we're supposed to get in return. The reason Jesus used this law, and I actually love this clause because it's important that God created something that nobody could get around. This particular scripture has nothing to do whether you save or unsave. If you, whatever you sow, that also shall you reap. And the reason I'm saying that because there are people that don't necessarily, necessarily trying to see Jesus, but they have sold the right things and they are receiving what they've sold. Why are you saved and you ain't kind? Have you ever seen that before? Yes, we've seen it because that's not what we sow it. You can't sow the right thing and receive the wrong thing. That's not how it works. But it's important to understand that frustration cannot be what we carry. It has to be love, and there's a reason for that. The other thing we have to realize is understanding that frustration speaks. It'll talk for itself. 
it, one thing about frustration, when you try to hide it, it'll come up. It'll show its head. Even without words. I found out anyway that over 68% of communication is nonverbal. Meaning most of what we do and what we say has nothing to do with what we say. People watch our body language. They watch how we move. They watch our responses. It's not always how we've articulated. It's not always what communication about. And notice I didn't say, I'm not talking about just talking. I'm talking about communicating. Second thing we have to understand, and this is so true because this law is true. If you so right, you will reap right. Tell you how. If we sow things with integrity and with the right heart, we'll reap it. The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Sometimes we're not receiving what it is we would like. It's because it's not important enough. Many of us don't feel that it's important enough to sow what we like. It's important for us to maybe ask ourselves, why is it that I'm not receiving what I like and what I want? When you're constantly in something and you keep telling yourself, it don't seem like I'm getting back what I'm giving, then you have to check what you're giving. And if what we're giving is lined up and mixed with other emotions besides authentic love, which we're going to talk about here in this next point, then that's why you're not receiving authentic love. Sometimes we can have good intentions, but we still are not projecting what we want. It's easy to project how we feel. Many people talk to one another and they may not feel the way you feel, but we like to project it and put it on you. But if we sow it right, meaning it's sold with integrity, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that we've got to learn how to give everything we give to God and to the people of God, not looking for anything in return. It is probably one of the hardest lessons to learn because everybody wants to feel a level of reciprocation. That is what relationship is about. You give, you take, you receive back. But the kingdom and the law principle of love has all to do with giving more than it does receiving. The Bible says that it is better to give than to what? Receive. When we give in God, we can't look for that back from what we're giving it to. We have to look from God. That's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. It's how many things don't work because the way we give it, we're giving it with an arterial motive. And if you don't do, I'm through. A true friend is a friend at all times. Not based on what we have, not based on what you give. Real friends. Because a real friend understands that you might be up and you might be down, but my friendship is not based even on how you treat me. That's not what friendship has to do with. Sowing right means that we sow with integrity. Understanding that our promises come from God. I can't give looking for you to give back because I'm obligating you. And therefore, I have to check how I'm sowing. If I'm looking for something back, then I'm giving it to you with the wrong motive. That's unfair. That means I gave you a gift with obligation. And love itself will denote when you're kind to people, it by itself will teach people how to be kind back. You have to understand that believers, our job is to display the goodness of God because many people that we come in contact with have not been taught. It's unfair to expect someone who has not been trained, who has not even been loved, who ain't even been treated right to understand what good treatment is. We get our feelings hurt so sensitive. I was good to them. You should have been good to them. You got to be honest and understand that when you enter into any agreement with God in relationship with people, that there are times that 
the people you're entering with do not really understand what you're giving. And I'm here to tell you, even if they leave, if you did it right, you will reap. If you did it right, I'm not talking about, that's how we get messed up. We get caught up on what other people are doing. I ain't talking about how they treated. I'm not talking about how they responded. I'm talking about our response. If you gave with godly, uh, uh, it's called the godly love, with godly, unconditional love, really trying your best to promote and to build and to unify and to cover. You can't be concerned about what they give back to you. But I'm here to tell you that you won't lack anything because the Bible says whatsoever a man saw it, that also shall he reap. He starts off saying I'm not mocked. Now, listen, I ain't no one to be played with. I'm not no joke. There is a, there's a principle that if you throw it out, you dish it out, you get it. I'm going to tell you why that's important. Because even after you get saved, if you start reaping stuff that you sowed a long time ago, don't get mad. Just to ask God to give you the grace to stand. <laughs> see, see, everything you sow when you get saved, grace ain't going to cover everything that way. Some things grace will sustain you, meaning it'll give you strength to stand and walk through it. Ain't it amazing how we get sweet all of a sudden and delivered and we act like we've been that way our whole life and then when somebody all of a sudden don't show the same sweetness back, we in awe, we broken hearted, can't believe this. As much as I'm giving. But I ain't always been that delivered. I haven't always been that kind. I haven't always seen it that way. I, I've been harsh on some things. I haven't always been empathetic. But now that I need it, I want somebody to give it. Why well, don't why why I don't have no knight in shining armor? <laughs> Why ain't nobody rescuing me on the horse? Because you don't ride horses. You never sold being a dancer. Why would God send you somebody to come get you out of distress and you wasn't a dancer? I'm just telling you like it is. If you always had your own horse, stop asking God to send a horse and carriage. Tell God the truth. I don't care if they walk in or on a horse. Send it right. Because I'm going to be honest, Lord. I've been on my own horse for a little bit. I've been galloping. When you so right, you, it's just true. We read all these nursery rhymes. Walt Disney got us messed up. Everybody don't have a Cinderella story. It don't work like that for everybody. And you ain't always sold Cinderella. Cinderella was meek. She was kind. She was humble. She got beat up. You didn't get beat up all the time. You was talking back. Go on. on. And you want the Lord, come on, Lord, I bring me some time. You're not kind. You're not sweet. You're not humble. You have to show humility. You, you, you have to show good treatment. You, you have to show humbleness. You have to show compassion. You have to show mercy. Then, then the mercy comes, you know. Then the mercy, it comes. It, it helps us. We be telling God what we want and he's saying, I need you to sow it. Sowing it means you're it. Frustration has guided our lives and destroyed enough of our relationship, our minds too long. Our relationships are fragmented. They're broken because there's frustration. And you've got to decide 
whether love's going to live or whether frustration's going to live. Frustration always blocks love. Those two can't share space. You know, I've learned something. Just because somebody's hurt you or you disagree don't mean you got to be frustrated about your disagreement. The frustration ain't the disagreement. There's something else in you that's bothering you. What is the root of your real frustration so that we can find out? Because if it keeps living, everything that God brings, you will reject or self-sabotage. People say, I'm changing. I'm trying to do better. You can but you got to understand and recognize when you are self-sabotaging what God has created to bless you. And most of the time it's because of frustration. It's because of things that we've allowed fester. We carry it year after year. They don't even know it. All I've got to do is touch that area. Mm -mm. Don't talk about that. Some of us now, you say something about our mama, we will lose salvation and bust every... Come on now. You ain't no little kid no more. We got to grow up. Some of us, you better not call our mama's name wrong. Don't say it. Not wise. This one I know is still frustration. If you hear their name, they ain't even talking about your mama. Your mama name. You be like, what? Wait a minute. Why are you used to wait a minute? Ain't nobody talking about your mama. They was talking about They ain't talking about they ain't talking about Sherry. But we don't realize frustration has a way of living quietly. My third and final point. Our due season will come. Our due season will come. No, our due season will come. This Bible, this scripture let us know it will come. If we faint not. So let me Break it down. Fainting for all of us looks different. Fainting for some means don't quit. Fainting for some means stop getting upset. Because you're messing it up. Stay, stick with it. It's going to happen. It should, when your due season comes, it'll happen. The key is when you're, and I love this because this is so individual based on us. Based on our own need. All of our seasons are not going to come at the same time. That's right. But when your due season come, you're going to reap. But this is how you know you will reap. If we honestly assess the situation, we believe in our heart that we are doing well, obeying God, and so on, we will reap a ripe harvest. Only in our due season. We have to understand that when we produce and sell love, it does not fail. Love does not fail. This is why we carry it. It does not fail. Love does not fail. So if you're looking at it and you're like, I'm doing all I can, if you really analyze the good, and you say, I'm giving it like you said, give it. I'm giving it in purity. I'm giving it in obedience. It don't fail. Let me, that's not because I said it. That's because the word said it. Not because I said it, but because 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 13, verse 8, says this. This is what it says. 13 and 8 says, charity never faileth. It says, whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. Or one says they shall vanish, meaning they're going to pass away. It's going to, if the prophecy going to come, it's going to go. But love never faileth. That means if I'm always caring and showing it, it's impossible for me not to receive it. Sometimes we think we are giving people love. 
But many times we're giving them our frustration, even with our children. Sometimes you'd be like, I love you, so I'm going to make it hard. Wait a minute. Don't make it too tough. Give me, a, give me a little sweetness. Why? Because this is what the word says about love. I didn't write this stuff. It says, charity suffereth long. It is kind. Charity envieth not. It vaineth not itself. And it is not puffed up. It doeth not behave itself unseemly. It seeketh not her own. It ain't about, love knows it's never about itself. Woo, God help us. Help us, God. No, I'm serious. Like, help us. I don't know about you, but I want lasting, sustaining relationships with God, with you, with my children, with my family. And that means what we sow has to be in love, not in anger, not in hurt, not in disappointment. Sometimes we give the people what we receive, but you got to change it. You're a child of God. You can't always give people what they gave back to you. You got to give people what you want. Yeah, oh yeah, people treated you bad. That's why, you know, I've noticed, truthfully, those that have been treated really, really bad should become the sweetest, sweetest people. Yeah. Because you understand what it really feels like to be on the low end. Right. 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 It should produce something else out of you. Like, I can't be like I've been treated. Right. This anger don't live, and I wouldn't want to put this on nobody. That's what love does. It says it rejoices in truth. It rejoices not in iniquity. It beareth all things. This will be messing me up. It beareth all things. Did you hear that? It beareth all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. Endures all things. Not some things. All things. Believe all things. No, I don't believe you. No, charity believeth all things. When you really love, you see the best. You, you try your best not to see the worst. When there's real love. There and understand this is not love on your own strength, it's a God man. That means you can't do this by yourself, you have to be spiritually infused in order to love us and even yourself. The reason you mad, you mess up with yourself. We don't love ourselves like this. You second guess yourself. You distrust yourself. You don't believe yourself. You give it up on yourself. When behavior goes bad, you gave up on yourself. We can't blame the environment for everything, although sometimes it helps. You can't blame everybody for everything. You have to understand that this is what love does. Then verse 10 says, But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. What is that which is perfect? Everything about love is maturity. And that word perfect means mature. When it hath grown. One of my favorite scriptures is perfect love casts away all fear. Perfect love. You know how people who say, I love but I'm scared. Perfect love casts away all fear. It means we have to what? Mature. Somebody asked me a question a couple of weeks ago about trust. They was, you know what? Don't people got to prove they trust to you? I said, that's one part. I said, but the other part of trust is faith. Because everything people can't prove to you right away. You're going to have to, oh, I'm messing somebody up. Oh, that's it. That's 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 when you talk about trust, you really have to have faith. Do you know what faith is? It's trust and assurance in God. There are some things that you can't everybody can't prove to you. We'll be going around all day. Some of, some of us will never be married again. Ain't that you ain't been before. Some of us will never be married again. Because we're going to mess around. Okay, you got to be with me 10 years. I got to see. 
How I'm gonna date you 10 years and stay saved? Girl? Okay, you can play around and act like you good, but I'm gonna tell you now, you keep dating somebody for 10 years, somebody's gonna mess up, okay? You can tell yourself, but we ain't gonna be dating for 10 years. You're gonna have to trust that I love you and believe me, and we're gonna have to move on, okay? I'm, I'm showing you who I am. You, you see my bank statements, what else? I got the same amount of money as you got. Ain't none of us rich. Some of us are too late in our life asking for rich people. You poor yourself. What you gonna ask somebody to be rich for? You you get the retirement, but you want them to come with the mountain. No, get yours and mine. We're gonna put them together. That's two retirements. That's two retirements. We can do something with two. Hallelujah. You get your SSI on the side. Hey, that's three checks. Hallelujah. We can business. We can, hallelujah. You mess around here waiting on somebody that's working hard, that they work 40, 50 years, and you're going to mess up with that frustration with money. Hey, we finna put these checks together. Hallelujah. Don't lie to yourself. The new senior citizen age is 55. Ain't nobody said you look old just because your age is there. Ain't nobody said you look bad. Use your benefits. Go up in there and get your discounts. Quit being mad with people. Tell them I'm 58. Thank you. Give me my three dollars off. You didn't work hard. God's been good. And the reason that's important. See, if you, if we keep sowing lies and deceit and untruth, it's what we're reaping. Why people keep lying? You gotta tell the truth. We gotta have this all together. You too late in your life to be talking about all together. That's unfair. That's not even right. We can't do that kind of stuff. When you're in your 20s, you can ask for them kind of prayer. You can't ask for no rich person later in your life. We just need this to work, okay? Can we get a senior citizen apartment? That's all I need to know. Hallelujah. Nobody mad at you. You too, I look good. Who cares? We're walking out. Almost 70 years old telling somebody they gotta own three houses. The devil is a lie. I'ma die before the payment is over. Stop lying to yourself. Get on over here. Walk down this aisle and say, I do. Hallelujah. So we can be saved and live right. This is getting crazy. God trying to bless you, trying to move. You still sowing, sowing deceit to yourself, telling yourself that you're back. You're not back in the day. This is a new day. Don't be mad. He said you'll reap if you think not. The enemy will trick us. He'll deceive us. Coming to a close, you, you think it's getting older and dim and you think it ain't going to happen. It's because you have to sow differently. It's just the truth. That's like me asking right now. To, that's like me asking to be an a athlete this time in my life. That makes no sense. Praying that kind of prayer, that makes no sense. No, it's not funny, but it's just the truth. The enemy will trick you. Telling yourself you're dirty. It's not, that's not true. Them days is gone, okay? Don't you want it right? You ought to be praying, God, I want help. What I have left, I want to what? Enjoy it. I want to be in peace. I, I want to live. I want to live right. I want to, I want to help somebody else and I want the person that wants the same thing that I want. Yeah. 
We ought to all be happy. All of us getting our checks on the same day. That's a blessing. Yes, yes. We all go in direct deposit. Right. So you know what? I thank you, God. Thank you for what we put together. We didn't work this out. It's all coming in at the same. You know, and you know, y'all think of plan. Because see what happens to people is the things that we devalue, we need to learn to appreciate. Some of the things that caused our first divorces and our first breakups is because we allowed money and issue and insecurity and, and false ambition to, to mess us up. You don't have enough, and, and I'm through with you. He was insecure because he thought you had more. Now we equal, girl. We equal now. We put them in. Who cares? They all working. We gonna go and put our age. Like, you wanna know how old we are? Cause yeah, I do look young, but I ain't. Give me my discount. I got my car wash last week, and I was reading car wash day Tuesday. Senior day, three dollars off. Thursday. Military three dollars off. I said, you know, I said people ought to be ashamed of themselves. They better go take advantage of all this stuff. Trying to live forever. The younger you are, the more money you pay. What you talking about? You better thank God. Get all them three dollars. Three dollars count, Sister Melvin. You paying twenty four ninety nine for a car wash? You get three or four dollars off. I'm trying to find coupons that will hardly all kind of stuff. What are you saying? When we carry the right stuff, frustration has caused us to have ulcers, closing, strokes, heart attacks, diabetes, cancer. Why? Because we've allowed things to fester so long that no matter what you've eaten, how much you've exercised, what's going on on the inside is still damaging your physical body. Because we cannot control your frustration. And it's cut our lives it's altered our lifestyles because we won't carry what we were created to carry, which is love. It is a risk, but when we do it in God, you will never have to worry about not reaping it. I've learned in my life, and maybe it had to do with being a kid with abandonment issues. You have to learn some stuff quick if you want to be healthy. You don't get to pick the source of your love. When you need it and God provides it, you say thank you. See, we put names on it. My mama, my daddy, my cousin. And when those things fail, No matter what God brought, it was never enough. Because it didn't have that name. But the God you serve is the creator of all things. We don't get to tell him how to bless you. And he's so faithful that what you need, he'll provide. You just disowned a person that chose to love you. They didn't even have to raise you. Don't even give them no credit. You still stuck on your mama. See, I learned that real quick. Love my parents. But I, I, look, I got over them at 15. Because I'm sitting up here looking at my grandparents doing all this work. It's a shame to be sitting up here stuck on y'all. They sitting up here doing all this work. And they were senior citizens. Oh, y'all think I'm, I'm, I'm just telling the truth. Here they are. They're old. Oh, uh, you didn't do I told 
get that. We're not going to live like that. Why? Because God has already provided a source. And I don't get to go back in prayer and say, bring it like this. What sower man soweth? If you're ungrateful, it's what you're going to reap. If you're unthankful, it's what you're going to reap. The reason we teach, give God the glory. The reason, if you notice specific, specifically this year, every time that artist got up, he's trying to uh, been encouraging us in another form of exhortation. Those are those are teaching lessons because it has to teach us. It teaches us to get out of our own routine, and it teaches us that there is nothing too big that you're dealing with that you don't that God doesn't deserve His praise. It's, it's teaching us those those concepts. So it doesn't matter, failure, none of that kind of stuff. You learn the way you get up and the way God blesses. God, I, I'm a believer of this. It's just the way the Lord works. Uh, I keep telling us God is about compassion, not pity. Pity is dangerous. When you pity things, it, it, you, go, you go for the okie doke. When you have compassion, it teaches you how to be empathetic or sympathetic to a cause. He don't pity us. Pity means you can't do it. God has compassion because he knows that you have greater in you, which is him. So he knows you can make it. And that's what we got to love about God. We have to understand that, listen, don't let frustration keep speaking for you. Let love carry. If you keep letting frustration speak, you'll miss every blessing that's really for you. Because frustration will block the love you want and the love you're trying to give. I'm all frustrated, I'm mad. And you have to ask yourself, what am I frustrated about? Is it worth me missing that next wave of glory, as Bishop T.D. Jakes often says? Is it worth it to continue to be upset, disappointed, dissatisfied with my life? You don't like your life? Change it. You serve a God that says, greater is he that is in you than what? He that is in what? The world. There's a lot of things you make we don't like. We can make those changes. That don't mean they're going to happen right away. I found out this, and this is a nugget. When you pray for patience, when you pray for patience, understand that the only way to develop patience is through situations. Patience is the highest form of discipline. And all of us have to learn how to exercise it. But you don't get strength for patience. You get grace to sustain the situation to develop patience. It's a learned behavior. I'm not, man, I ain't that patient. That situation, if you allow it, will teach you. How to be patient because you will learn. Ain't no use of getting all up, been out of shape. Ain't nothing I can do anyway. I'm going to do what I can and then I'm going to move on. Because if I get, because if I, if I, if I keep getting frustrated, I'm going to stay in anxiety. And anxiety all the time is not good. I told, I shared with you all before, we're not supposed to live on adrenaline. Come on. That's given to us for specific traumatic events for a short period of time to protect us. Adrenaline is not something that you live off of. Amen? Stand to your feet, people of God. How many people want to carry love and, and then really remove as much frustration out of your life as you can? I'm with you. I understand it. It's something we all have to practice. Because as long as God has given us breath, there's an opportunity for things to get better. I'm a believer of this. You can believe it if you want to or you don't have to. But I believe that when God is finished with you, he'll take you. As long as he allows you to wake up, it indicates that there is yet purpose for you. And that alone is enough to be excited about. Yes, it is. My life is over. But you're breathing, right? 
Is it really over? No. When you, I'm telling you, when God is really finished with you, you think I'm playing. He's done. When he has no more for you left to do, when you've, when you've done your purpose in the earth, you're out of here. You waking up still? Woo. You ought to be excited. You hear me? I ain't saying that you may not be tired, but you ought to be, be tired and excited. Be like, woo, thank God I'm up. Because it could have been, I thought it could have been over. That means that you still have an opportunity for great things to happen in your life. Things, bad things happen and you be like, it's over. And God say, no, it ain't. I ask the Lord to teach me, when I lose something great that I love, help me, teach me how to continue to move forward. You know what he said? You have to train yourself. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in me, it's a trained behavior. We have to teach ourselves. Because if you put all your eggs, hopes and dreams in one entity, if he decides to take the basket, we have to train ourselves so that we can see things. I ask that because I had buried a friend that was my age. Graduated from high school. And I had a tough time understanding why this young man with a wife and two girls died of brain cancer. We're the same age. Nicest guy I ever met. Always full of life, full of faith. And I was like, ugh. You know, when you when you folks start going to your age, you get a little more sensitive. Yes. You know, people, people 80, oh. 75, oh. 38, ooh. What happened? You know, your age group. I, said, I, couldn't, I, had, I was trying to understand. I said, because, you know, our own mortality. Like, man, that could have been, that could be me. But I had to learn and understand that, listen, everybody is selected and given a certain purpose on this earth. And the reason this is so important is because if you keep discrediting your life and your trials and what he has brought you through and it keeps becoming a negative in your life, you're going to miss the whole reason you're here. I said, okay, I'm with you, Lord. I'm cool. I understand purpose good. He said, you, this, this is why you can never compare yourself. Because I know what I have for you. I know what I have. You start thanking God. For some stuff. You say, hey, hey. So I can handle that. That ain't nothing. But that's what happens. We have to sow better. So we can reap better. Yes. Not just monetary. The things that you want in life. Yes. You have to sow it. You want peace? Sow it. It's true. You want people to be kinder to you? Be kind. You want people to be loving to you? Be loving. And if you do it in love not expecting anything back from that source, then God will provide. 
That's why God doesn't want us looking for anything from anybody else because we take away from him giving us. There are certain things that God reserves for himself to, to give to you. It ain't for nobody else to bless you. It's for him. Because when God blesses you with something, nobody else controls it. You don't have to worry about nobody taking or tampering with it. When he does it, it's done. it's done beautifully. And whatever God gives you, understand this. He can sustain it and keep it. He can keep it. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. God, we thank you. Appreciate you. We love you because of your faithfulness. We thank you for what you're doing. God, we pray now that you teach us how to carry love so that we can remove frustration from our lives, from our minds, from our hearts, from our spirits. We thank you for all that you're doing the great things that you're manifesting in us. There's no one like you. No one like you in the world, on the earth. We appreciate you. Teach us now, God, how to be those people, how to love and sow, how to sow what we want and become what it is that we need to sow. Teach us. Give us the grace we need to sustain. And if you do so, God, we'll love you. Let the people of God say thank God. Thank God. Amen. Come on and give our pastor a hand, praise. We certainly want to take a moment and thank our live streamers that joined us on today. We pray that you were blessed just like we were. We encourage you to visit us here in the sanctuary. We're located at 427 East Fremont Street in the city of Stockton. If you want to find out more about this ministry and certainly uh, uh, provide a donation to this ministry and be blessed, you can find us at www.newgreaterlove.net. Thanks once again for joining us, and we'll see you next week.